Hello, hello guys. Good evening everybody. I hope everyone's doing well here. Uh, thank you for joining in. I appreciate for your support. And it's nice to meet you. So guys, today I'm going to be doing like a two camera video podcast again, uh, which I'm doing on I think yeah, Big O and YouTube. Yes, YouTube Live. So anyways. Uh, let me just get into the topic tonight, okay? So usually, okay, before I go to the topic, this is kind of like a any topic podcast, all right? So basically, I usually talk about any topics. Uh, you guys can ask me. Uh, feel free to, you know, come online as well so that we can chat. Uh, also, you know, point out what you want to talk about. You know, so that we can always debate, discuss, uh, comments. Uh, you can agree or you can disagree with me. Uh, but, you know, at the end of, end of the day, we will try to figure out a solution here. Anyways, thank you very, very much for joining in here, guys. I appreciate it. Okay. All right. So, anyways, okay. Today, you know, I was thinking maybe I was, I was going to talk about women's right to vote uh, particularly we'll try to see some some of the things that has been going on in other parts of the world and also i think maybe we can always go back in history as well and try to figure out you know some of the nuts and bolts on how you know it has come all the way until today all right okay nice to meet you guys thank you very much okay so guys, if you didn't know, Bigo is like a phone app and you usually get some gifts. Uh, you, you can, you know, type your comments. You can get some flower gifts. You, you know, I think you can get even like uh, gifts that is a little monetary. So I'm not too sure about that, but you know, what I'm doing is I'm just doing like a volunteer work here. Uh, just, I just wanna reach out to people and, you know, sort of, Come about with a platform, I guess, from from the ground up. But anyways, I have about 75 years now, so I'm very thankful for you guys. Okay. So, okay, you know, actually I decided to talk about this woman's right to vote. Uh, so what comes to my mind actually is, I actually come, come to think of it, there's this particular law in the United States, you know, constitution, which is the 15th Amendment, right? The 15th Amendment, I'm going to say it, okay? This is from the book. The 15th Amendment, based on that citizen's race, color, or previous condition of certitude, it was ratified on February 3rd, 1870, as the third and the last of the Reconstruction Amendments. Isn't that interesting? You see? Like, you know, think of it, you know, I'm from, by the way, guys, if you didn't know, I'm from India. I come from a state called Nagaland, which is in the northeast part of India. Uh, we're we're part of, the, part of the northeast part of India, uh, mostly, uh, actually, it's also called the eight sister states. So if you didn't know, there's like eight sister states. So eight states in the northeast. Um, so anyways. Uh, so that's, I, I kind of, I would like to draw some parallels with Northeast and also Nagaland, particularly because I'm from Nagaland as well. I want to kind of like draw some parallels here and maybe try to connect with, you know, uh, Indian women's rights, American women's rights, European women's rights, you know, and all that kind of stuff. All right, guys. Kim Jan, I appreciate it for... Uh, coming in here. By the way, guys, I actually forgot. Two of my friends actually suggested me uh, to invite them. Oh, gosh. Okay, I'm just going to uh, text them. Okay, guys, sorry about that. Just five, just, just a minute, I think. Less than five minutes, I think. Hold on. Okay. OK, 
Okay, all right. Oh, where am I from? I'm from Nagaland. It's a, it's in a state in India, guys. Okay, no. Kim Jen. All right, thank you for the question here. Okay, guys, I've already sent all the invitations, so let's get ready. So, <clears throat> what is neo Malthusianism, right? I hope I said it right. neo Malthusianism, right? It generally refers to people with the same basic concerns as Malthus, who advocate population control programs to ensure resources for current and future populations in Thomas Robert Malthus' book, An Essay on the Principles of Population. Malthus observed that sooner or later, population will be checked by famine and diseases, leading to what is known as Malthusian catastrophe. So this is kind of like a precursor of what I'm gonna be talking about as well. Um, so I will kind of name some of the authors, you know, some of the, you know, advocates who champion women's rights, okay? And particularly in the West. And maybe I'll delve, delve in a little bit into, you know, Northeast India as well. And, you know, actually maybe some Indian uh, authors maybe, or journalists, uh, but I'm not very, I'm not very, I would say very knowledgeable about that. So I'll not, I'll try not to touch too much on that, by the way. But anyways, uh, let me just get into it. So I'm going to define what is suffragist, okay? So guys, if you didn't know, women's right actually start, started way back in the Constitution of the United States, right? I was telling you about the amendment, and I think maybe we can sort of hang in around that time era, and then you know we can move on further down, okay? <clears throat> So suffragists is more general term for a member of the suffrage movement. It particularly refers to militants in the United Kingdom, such as the members of the suffragist is a, a word, suffragist, uh, suffragettes is also another word, okay? So suffragettes, S-U-F-F-R-A-G-E-T-T-E-S. -T -T suffragettes were members of women's organization in the late 19th and early and going back to you know, WSPU, right? <clears throat> so these were a group of women in America and also uh, mostly part of Europe as well. It, it, it's it's kind of like a, it's connected, somehow it's connected with the, the American movement and, you know, the European uh, women's movement as well and in Russia as well, you know. So uh, I think this is kind of interesting topic because, you know, I was thinking about my state, particularly in Netherlands as well, uh, I think women, you know, they were kind of protesting and, you know, doing activist work and all that kind of stuff. And I think this is kind of very relevant to what was happening, like, you know, during during the 1800s in the United States and also in Europe. But unfortunately, there's a lot of forces in power. And I think the administration and the government kind of like shut them down. Uh, which is very unfortunate. Um, also, I think even, you know, the public leaders, ministers, um, you know, just a bunch of leaders who are running the show, they kind of, you know, disregarded the women's right to vote or women's right to not vote, particularly in India, because this is, well, this is a 21st century. But... You know, what I'm saying is that there were some problems when elections were happening in India, and particularly in the Northeast, and uh, I felt like maybe I should talk a little bit about it. So my stance on women's right, uh, okay, women's right to vote, okay, this is way past, you know, our generation, but women's right or, you know, women's position in higher authorities, such as, you know, uh, political parties, leaders, uh, of 
some political groups or you know uh, what not have you uh, i think this is lacking in our society and you know i know india is lacking a lot particularly you know in delhi i, I feel like the parliament house is pretty much a man's den you see i hardly see any woman who's advocating or uh, who is you know coming up you know very strongly on certain aspects and you know but there there are few i would say who do come you know in the limelight and the problem here is you know those women who come in you know tvs and tv shows and you know news channels uh, during the parliament debate or you know some kind of a journalism kind of thing they're usually very you know centric i would say a little too too much on either left or too much on the right so i feel like there should be a balance i'm not kind of like advising women to I also feel like women and men are equal uh, to, you know, in this world, I think, you know, we're capable of doing many things equally, right? Maybe some things are not equal, such as, you know, physical labor or all that, but, you know, it kind of <clears throat> substitutes for other things where men cannot do certain tasks and women can do, right? So... Yeah, so it's it's almost like a give and take, I guess. So, you know, I'm going to very briefly talk about some of the <clears throat> uh, kind of like associations, groups in the West and particularly in America. OK, uh, so this this is pertaining to women's rights. So, yeah, let's try to stick to the topic now. OK. So who who is okay? Let's go. Who is Mary Kingsley? Okay, Mary Kingsley. So I'm going to point out some names here, and I hope uh, I'm not saying you know this is a lecture, guys. This is not a lecture. This is just like a a freehand debate, freehand you know video podcast. So you know, feel free to like ask me questions or you know uh, like if I say some certain names, uh, just. Ask me if I didn't say it right, so that you know you can. I can always repeat it. Okay, Mary Harrietta Kingsley was an English ethnographic, scientific writer, and explorer uh, who travels throughout West Africa, resulting work, uh, resulting in work she helped shape European perceptions of African cultures and British imperialism. Okay, so I have a question here by Ramu Kaka. Uh, so this is from the Nagamese lexicon, okay? And he says, itu ki, question mark. And I don't know if I should keep repeating during my you know, talks here, but I will for the sake of my viewers here. So Ramu, I'm actually talking about women's rights women's rights to vote in history and also women's position in you know political you know affiliations or you know political parties or them becoming the leaders uh, in today's world so yeah so something about women's rights okay all right okay so i'm gonna move on guys so what is surplus women okay Okay, before I go to surplus women, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, you know, uh, interracial marriages and internet, inter interracial relations as well. So there's a particular name for it. It's called miscegenation. Okay, miscegenation. I, I hope I'm saying it right uh, from the, <laughs> the British, uh, uh, you know, tone here. It's the mixing of different racial groups through marriage, cohabitation, sexual relations or procreation. The term mis miscegenation has been used since the 19th century to refer to interracial marriages and interracial sexual relations. So yes, I think uh, this is kind of important as well because if you notice like uh, interracial marriages, interracial you know, relations was not very common in America during those days. And there's a lot of proponents who advocated for uh, non, 
interracial, you know, relations or marriages publicly. And, you know, I think black folks, African-American folks, uh, they had a hard time, especially uh, men as well, you know. I think, you know, they couldn't, you know, even sit in the same train lobby. You know, they had to sit in the back where, you know, they cannot sit with the white folks. Uh, and you have the Jim Crow law laws, you have, uh, what else? You know, well, you have slavery as well. You know, slavery was, wasn't was abolished like so, for so many years, just recently, if you think about it, you know. Uh, so, you know, women's right actually is part and parcel of all these problems in uh, particular civilization per se, which is the American civilization. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to collaborate all these kind of civilizations and trying to make sense of how we can put this puzzles into uh, our box, which is our comfortable boxes, wherever we are, wherever we live, I think we can always relate and we can always, you know, try to apply it in, in, in our lives and in our communities and societies and uh, whatnot, okay. So, okay, we spoke about, you know, interracial. So we're, we're talking about early 1800s to, you know, say 1900s, okay. Uh, and we'll try to move on uh, from there, okay. Okay, Ramu Kaka, again, I'm gonna kind of read out the question here, okay. Forget about America, tell me something about Naga origin till date, I'm trying to search for a date. <laughs> well, you know, best of luck, Ramu. I, I, you know, I'm not a matchmaker, uh, but, you know, I hope uh, the best for you and, you know, Hopefully, you know, God will. Surplus woman, you know, it, it was it was it was a phrase kind of which was coined during the Industrial Revolution, uh, which which uh, kind of referred to perceived excess of unmarried women in Britain. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> I think there was a lot of unmarried women in Britain during those days. Well, Ramu, dude, I think you would have been perfect match in England during the 1800s because there was a lot of men who went for wars and there was a lot of women who were not married. So I think you should have been there those days. Uh, it would have been perfect for you. <laughs> but anyways, uh, moving on. So what is Contagious Diseases Act? Okay, that's a very interesting act because it was a, kind of like implemented during the 1864, okay, in the West. So this kind of, plays uh, with the same narrative here, okay? So, uh, Contagious Diseases Act, uh, also known as CDX, were originally passed by the Parliament of the United Kingdom in 1864, which, with alterations and additions made in 1866 and 1869. In 1862, a committee was established to inquire into venereal diseases. So what is venereal diseases? I think you doctors or people who are studying medicine will know that this is, this act kind of ties in with the war as well because there was a lot of armies, you know, armed forces who were, you know, fighting the war and they were like uh, getting sick and, you know, in the barracks and, you know, in the camps. So. One of the solutions that they had to do was they had to hire prostitutes, you know, so they had to, you know, um, get all those, you know, prostitutes from wherever country they are. And, and, you know, that's how there was, there was kind of like an outbreak of disease out there. So, yeah, the armed forces was primarily, uh, you know, uh, responsible for it as well. Okay, on its recommendation, the first Contagious Disease Act was passed, right? The, the legislation allowed police officers to arrest women suspected of being prostitutes in certain post and army towns. The women were then subjected to compulsory checks for venereal diseases. If a woman was declared to be infected, she would be confined in what was known as the Lock Hospital until she recovered for her, uh, you know, recovered or, you know, she was sentenced to, uh, you know, some kind of a hospital where she's isolated probably for many years or months, I don't know. But anyways, uh, I'm gonna move on, okay? So who is Lucy Burns, by the way? 
Lucy Burns, she was born in 1879 and she died in 1966. So we're still in the 18th kingdom. Burns was a close friend of Alice Paul and together they ultimately formed the National Women's Party. Some of the films that kind of talks about Lucy Burns uh, are Iron Jog Angels, chronicling the struggles of Lucy Burns, Alice Paul and other suffragists. So guys, if you're interested in, you know, any any of the suffragist movement, I think you can probably watch this movie, Iron Jog Angels, uh, which talks about Lucy Burns' um, history. Anyways, I'm going to move on here. Okay, so who is Alice Paul? She, you know, Alice Paul is part of Lucy Burns, uh, you know, same group. Okay, so Alice Paul was also an American suffragist, and she was a feminist and women's rights activist, and the main leader of strategist of leader and strategist of the 1900s campaign for the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which prohibits sex, you know, during that time. And I think this is kind of interesting as well, uh, because these are the women who kind of led, you know, the, the whole, you know, right to vote for women and people of color, you know, and all that stuff. So, okay. So, like I said, you know, People like Lucy Burns and you know Alice Paul, they were very involved in all these events and campaigns and uh, whatnot. So some of the groups that pertain to you know uh, uh, kind of 1916 as an outgrowth of the Congressional Union, which is in turn was formed in 1913 by Alice Paul and Lucy Burns to fight for women's rights. Right. So guys, I'm going to actually uh, talk to you a little bit about the Cat and Mouse Act. Okay, this is kind of interesting. I don't know if you've heard of the Cat and Mouse Act. So before I go into it, I'm just going to briefly uh, give you a little bit of overview of what I'm doing today. Um, guys, this is for the new folks here. Uh, I usually do like a freehand uh, video podcast every, you know, twice or twice uh, a week. And I sort of come online live and I kind of talk about pretty much uh, listen to me and watch me live. So uh, I, I'm very thankful for that. But if you haven't subscribed to my channel, please go ahead and add me, you know, so that maybe next time I come online uh, live, you can, you can see it in your notification, in your phone, in your computer uh, or in your uh, device, any kind of device here. So I'm going to be talking about women's rights, particularly uh, in starting from the West and going to, you know, Europe and we'll touch a little bit on India as well. Um, and also my land, which is the Northeast part of India, the Northeast eight sister states. OK, so, yeah, just hang in there, guys, buckle up. And if you have any questions, please feel free to. Put your comments there uh, and just, you know, ask me questions, we'll debate about it, okay? All right, okay. So what is the Cat and Mouse Act? This act was uh, kind of like passed in 1913, okay? The, it's called the Cat and Mouse Act, which allowed the government to release a suffragist once she became too ill from a hunger strike and to rearrest her when she recovered. Wow, isn't that amazing what the government can do? So it's basically like saying like, oh, you know, the women are out uh, fighting for their rights, right? Which is exactly what's happening right now with the, you know, with the whole CAA and everything in India as well. I think a lot of Muslim women are coming up as well, you know, unveiling their, you know, uh, sacred vows, which is the burqa. And I think that's that's a very, very uh, brave move that you women are doing in India. Because um, I see the news sometimes, and I think this is kind of like, uh, that's why I thought maybe I should, you know, kind of uh, bring this topic up, you know. Um, we don't have that kind of, you know, suppression here in the Northeast per se, but we do have like some kind of, 
uh, you know, hangups from the past, which needs to be uh, spoken about, because I feel like a lot of folks around here don't really want to talk about it. And, you know, be it like women's rights, you know, I think like you should really consider like to speak up, uh, protest outside, you know, go out in the streets or, you know, in the, in the parliament house or the government's house and, you know, ask for your rights, you know, it's your rights, it's your you know, it's the public's rights, it's public's property, you know, it's it's not in the hands of some bunch of, you know, uh, idiotic goons and, um, you know, heartless people. I think it's, it's very important that, you know, we should come out and kind of like, you know, speak, speak out for our rights, okay? So anyways, guys, I'm just going to move on here. So the Cat and Mouse Act was kind of interesting because the government, what they did was when recovered and healed, uh, they kind of, you know, let her go. And then again, they kind of re-arrest her, which is, which is uh, mental, I would say. So who is the person who is kind of uh, in conjunction with this cat and mouse act? Uh, Emily, Emily Pankhurst, okay. Emmeline, okay, Emmeline Pankhurst. Uh, she was repeated, repeatedly imprisoned and released under this act. Sub sub subsequently, confrontations became even more violent. On May 31st, 1930, Emily Wilding Davidson threw herself to allow Emily Pankhurst to march in the funeral. Okay, so who set herself on like a mission to save, um, you know, this whole suffrage movement and women's right to vote? Was her name is called Emily? No, sorry, Emily Wilding Davidson who threw herself in front of the racehorse, okay, at the derby. So basically, this, it's not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's like a suicide, okay, but she almost, she killed herself, basically, because she wanted to tell the world, she wanted to tell the American public, and, you know, the whole women, uh, you know, advocates for their rights to vote, that, you know, look, we're serious about this, you know, if you don't, if you if, if the government and the police don't do anything about it, you know, we're going to make it a big show here. And what happened? We we lost uh, a dear soul. We lost a life. So, you know, I hope this doesn't come to India as well. And I also hope that this doesn't come to Northeast, at least to that extreme, because, um, you know, when people want something, I think uh, they'll do anything to get that. So, um, yeah, I hope, you know, the new generation uh, folks here who are listening to me, or even the old generation folks here who are online, I think you should give it a thought, you know, uh, just sit back and kind of think about it and, you know, maybe uh, allow some of the rights for women to, you know, uh, go forward in policy making or uh, uh, whatever it is, right? So we don't want that cat and mouse act in our country, okay, or in our state. I'm going to skip out on some of the authors here, okay, because, okay, well, I was going to skip out a guy's author here, but I'll just, I'll just, you know, kind of talk a little bit about it. John Stuart Mill, okay, his date of birth was 1806 to 1873, right? John Stuart Mill, he was, he was an author, right, a philosopher, political economist, and a civil servant, right? He actually he was the first man actually in the West who actually written, who wrote on the subject uh, on you know the subjugation of women um, during that time. So I think why I bring this up because it's it's kind of like crucial for you know for the other gender to kind of like uh, help out the other gender as well. You know, it's it, like I said, you know, at the end of the day, we're living in this world where you know we have to men are equal in many ways. Okay. So John Stuart Mill, his book, The Subjugation of Women, published in 1869. So I think if you guys or, you know, or girls, whoever is interested in this kind of subject, I would say you might want to read this book, The Subjugation, the su not Subjugation, actually, The Subjection of Women, okay, uh, which was one of the earliest writings about the uh, women's movement, okay. He talks about the role of women in marriage and how it needs to be changed, which is very interesting, right? Uh, 
uh, if you have to think about India, because India, man, I tell you, uh, there's a lot of problems out there with dowry as well, which I'm not a big advocate for. Uh, I feel sorry for the women and her family. Um, but hey, don't get me wrong, you know, it takes time, you know, to heal. And I know that there's a lot of progress that's going on in India, but now for God's sake, you know, like, you know, I think uh, India should respect women, particularly in, you know, in, in parts of Delhi, uh, mostly in Delhi, I would say. It's, it's ridiculous, man, how they treat women. Uh, but anyways, I'm just, I'm just saying here, okay, that's just my personal opinion. Uh, you can like me or not, but it's, I'm just going to say, it. <clears throat> okay. All right. Okay. So he talks about, you know, how marriage and how the treatment of women should be changed. Okay. So I won't go too much into it, um, because, you know, I think it'd be uh, a waste if I say it and, and if you don't want to read it, but for the sake of, uh, humanity's, you know, progress, I think we'll just move on here. Okay. All right. Okay. So I already explained to you what is suffrage and what is suffragist. Okay. And what's, what are, what is suffragists again? So there's three words out there. Uh, I think you should be aware of that. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to say another, let's say, let's put like two more groups here and maybe we can uh, wrap this up. Uh, okay. So there is another group which was very prominent in 1969 in New York, right? New York City. The National Association was created in response to the split of the American Equal Rights Association over whether the women's movement should support the 15th Amendment to the United States Constitution. So guys, if you didn't know, I kind of explained what is the 15th Amendment. So on a footnote, okay, I'll just, tell you again, the 15th Amendment to the United States Constitution, it prohibits the federal and the state government from denying a citizen to right to vote based on that citizen's race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Okay, so this was ratified during February 3rd, 1870 uh, as the third and the last of the reconstruction of the amendments. Guys, thank you very, very much. Okay, I'm actually looking at the kind of like the, you know, comments and live like gifts you're giving and I appreciate it, okay, so much. Um, the thing is, you know, it's kind of getting a little late here. Um, I'm doing like a one hour video podcast, so uh, I won't put too much breaks here for today, uh, but, Next time, we'll definitely do like a one-on-one -on -one conversation with, uh, you know, you viewers here. Okay. All right. So the second one is the Women's Social and Political Union, WSPU. Okay. Uh, WSPU is a group. Okay. It was, it was the leading militant organization campaigning for women's suffrage in the United Kingdom. This was during... 1903 to 1917, okay, now, so we're moving from the 1800s, okay, to the 1900s, okay. Uh, so this was controlled by Emmeline Pankhurst, okay, the same lady who was involved, who was, who was very much involved in, you know, the whole suffrage movements in the West, okay. Uh, it was, I think it was, and her daughters as well, Chris, Christabel and Sylvia, okay. Anyways, uh, so, I'm going to kind of uh, point out another interesting fact here. Uh, so, guys, I know you, you guys are very aware of the United Nations, you know, the Security Council uh, and, you know, the, the five P's and, you know, all that stuff here. And also, you know, it's, it's very important to know all this because, you know, you have a lot of big, big laws that have been ratified in the United Nations, and it plays a very big part on, uh, you know, our human uh, living and our uh, lifestyle here. So uh, the WWP, right, the Women's Peace Party, uh, so this is, we're talking about 1915, okay, 1915, uh, this is where it was at The Hague, Netherlands, okay, so this peace meet, meeting in 1915, uh, so there were 12 members, 12 countries, okay, uh, which met at the International Peace Conference of Women in 1950. 
Uh, good night, Kishan. I, I appreciate it. Okay, good night. Good night, buddy. So, Italy, Poland, Belgium, and the United States. So, these were all dedicated to, you know, to the resolution of the great international conflict that was World War One, but also uh, there was, you know, there was a kind of like a conference for women's rights. I mean, we're talking like way back in 1915, man. You know, so this is very interesting how, like I said, you know, again, like if a person wants something, uh, he or she will do whatever it takes to get that, okay? And it is very important to him or her. So. Although the transatlantic travel during that time, which is transatlantic, meaning you know you you go over to Atlantic through ship during those days, that's how the slaves were you know taken from the West African region all the way to you know the southern parts of America, right? Uh, so I think the Portuguese were also very you know very important player in you know the slave trade at the Atlantic. Uh, you know, uh, path. Then came the British as well, you know. So I think this whole channel is a very historic uh, channel here, but going back to the peace meeting, uh, women, some women from America, they travel all the way to the transatlantic slave trade, right? Now, the same trade where the slaves went, you know, where the traders went, these women went and, you know, it was not like, you know, comfortable AC, you know, uh, cruises that we, enough lifeboats, uh, forget like signals, like, you know, satellites and all that stuff where we can like do an SOS and, you know, we'll get choppers and freaking, you know, uh, jet airways to come and help you guys out. But uh, we're talking, you know, back in the 1900s where they didn't have any, you know, security, no safety and women, 47 women, American women sailed all the way to Europe uh, from that route just to attend that women's meeting. So that that's how much they were dedicated, okay? So yeah, we'll just move on here. Um, so I think that's that's it for the suffragists. You know, I, I won't go too much into it, you know. Now, <laughs> so what we're experiencing now in, so guys, I'm gonna delve, okay, delve into which is the Nagaland, narrative okay that's my city okay and i think if i'm speaking about a particular state doesn't mean it's only that state okay it could mean other states as well in the indian uh, you know in the indian country in the country uh, that we live in so what i'm going to say is the topic here is what are the vices Okay, and what are the challenges in order to curb those vices in our land, or it could be in your land as well? So, so I would say corruption is definitely a vice in my state, at least. Uh, corruption is number one, okay? I would say number one. Uh, this is going to be like a, you know, I would say a com 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 comparing and contrasting from different you know vices that happen in different countries and what's happening here as well okay uh, in my hometown okay so I'm just going to give you a little bit of compare and contrast uh, so that you know maybe we can derive some points home and you know do something about it okay so I'm going to start by talking about Anthony Comstock, okay? Anthony Comstock, he was an anti-vice activist, okay? And he was also the U.S. Postal Inspector, okay, in America, okay? So, so this is, I mean, this is 1800s, I think, yeah. Anthony Comstock, hold on a second. Anthony Comstock, he was born in 1844, who died during 1915, okay. All right, okay. So we're talking uh, 1800s to 1900s, okay. So anyways, clean up his place. Um, Anthony Comstock 
is 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 somebody who is fighting vices and during his time. Okay. So it's kind of like setting up this moral influence, okay, which is very important because you know you could be very influential in book, you know, your policies, but if there is no, you know, moral grounds, I mean you lose the battle eventually, right? Or even though you win, it's not going to be for the long run. Okay. Now why I want to say Anthony Comstock is, you know, it's like almost like a Superman is because during his time people were blinded. Uh, they didn't know what was good and what was bad eventually. Like we're talking Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, and about, uh, a lot of societal problems, you know, sexual immorality, uh, you know, prostitution, trafficking, you know, all that stuff. So Captain Zach Sparrow has a question for us. OK, yes, sir, what is your topic? So I spoke a little bit about women's right before you came here, but I'm not going to go too much into it, but it's about suffragists. OK and the evolution of suffragists and how it has come today. Now I'm speaking about some of the vices that are prevalent in our society and how we can tackle them and how we can compare and contrast with other places and other events and other people, how they have found a solution towards that, okay? That is the topic right now. And maybe you can join in, you can debate, you can ask questions, okay? All right, okay. So, Anthony Comstock and Superman also. Okay, I said he's like Superman, but I'm going to put this Superman also in, in our character, okay? So, Superman and Comstock. I mean, look at, you know, so look at these two. I, I think they have very similar uh, characteristics. I think they have a lot of, you know, common you know, principles that kind of uh, make them, um, you know, hand in glove, okay? So I picked Comstock and Superman because they were both active in fighting vice, okay? And they set the bar for moral influence. Superman believed in the individual and democracy, okay? Well, I say democracy because, you know, I was kind of thinking like Superman was almost like a demigod. So I didn't want to really say democracy because, you can't be a dictator uh, while you're still running a democratic nation, right? But you cannot also be a demigod and run a democratic nation. So I will kind of, you know, jiggle with that a little bit. <laughs> but anyways, he was a great man, right? Anthony Comstock. And we can, you know, draw a lot of parallels with Superman and how they're similar. Okay. He was there at the right time. Okay. Superman believed in the individual and also fighting vices. So he represented the common people during the crisis and unjust ruling. Like I said, this was this was very bad times in America, okay? Uh, and his vision for moral society is unquestionable. So if you kind of uh, do a little bit of digging on Anthony Comstock and his work and his, you know, activism i think uh, you will get a little more idea but i'll just give you like a little flavor of it maybe you can you know do your own research later on but anyways his vision for moral society is unquestionable and the problems he fought for reflects in today's vibe sometimes you know very conservative uh, very you know very homey in in, in a very uh, casual uh, lexicon but you know we tend to be very you know very traditional and, you know, we always stick to what is, you know, what is, has, what has been taught to us from our parents and all that stuff. So another question here, Captain Zach Sparrow, is morality predestined? Mm, I would say yes and no. I'll say why yes, because when you're a kid, uh, your moral ground is number, you know, number one, okay? It's it's 100% clean. So that's why I say yes, but the world kind of makes us <laughs> non-moral eventually. But so that's why I say no again, uh, because you kind of get drifted away by, you know, the lures of the world and the vices of, you know, uh, all the, you know, bad things out there. So 
Yeah, so that's my answer, guys. Captain Zach Sparrow, thank you for your question. I appreciate it. Okay, and so Anthony Comstock, okay. So his attempt in silencing the Free Love Society, okay. Guys, the Free Love Society was a society that was engaged daringly, okay, in the United States, okay, uh, of like obscene activities, okay, and, you know, a, a lot of adultery, a lot of open, you know, uh, sexual stuff, uh, a lot of, you know, pamphlets, magazines, which was just, you know, it was everywhere. It, and there, there, there was a lot of trafficking as well. Um, you know, they advocated for pretty much, you know, I, I kind of, it kind of reminds me of the Woodstock again, where, you know, that generation pretty much died of overdose, I would say, you know, people just did a lot of drugs, you know, people listened to, I was at, Okay, here's the thing. I wouldn't go against the music part because I think there was very good music, at, you know, during that era. But you know, but when it came to like the moral grounds and you know people's lifestyle, it definitely hampered their you know health and their generation. It was, it was kind of like a lost generation where there was no credibility in you know whatsoever on on their moral grounds because it was just you know drugs, sex. Uh, and music, you know, but anyways, uh, that's a different story because I think we're, we, we were also experiencing a kind of like a transatlantic war, which is World War II. And, you know, it was definitely not a good thing because I certainly feel like the, the best way to curb any, uh, any conflict is through diplomacy and peace. And I think that's, that's, that's the way we should go. Okay. Um, so anyways, I'm going to be moving on here. Um, Although he had made many people against him, because see, when you're fighting for a good, right? When you're fighting for good, there's always the bad. Okay, so there's this, uh, let's let's put it this way, yin and yang, okay? So there's this yin and yang, uh, which always collides, okay? And, you know, there's it doesn't work out sometimes. Sir, are you a theologian? He, 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 Captain Jack Sparrow. No, no, I'm not a theologian, okay? I don't necessarily have to be a theologian to speak about uh, moral grounds but it's just for my personal views man you know uh okay i'm just going to give you a little bit of overview here on my personal background i i you know i have a ba okay um in history and political science and i do have my associates aa from uh so these are all from california okay AA, AA in social and behavioral sciences uh, with an emphasis on history as well. So that's there. And I did my master's in diplomacy, diplomatic studies from England. Okay. So I don't know where that theology comes from, but maybe it comes from, you know, uh, maybe some, uh, maybe a good side of it. Maybe, you know, you, you can call that. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. I'm going to move on. So Comstock could differentiate between what is good and what is bad, okay? He kind of differentiated because during that time, you know, people were just going uh, haywire. And there are some people who, whose eyes are open and, you know, he was one of them. He understood the evil nature and took bold steps to litigate the vice and evils within the society. Uh, Kemney reports on, okay, Kemney is like a reporter, okay? And a, probably an author as well. Kemney reports on Anthony Comstock in the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice about his empty, anti obscenity views, and soon enough, he took effort in arresting those free love advocates. And without a doubt, he had faced several controversial convictions and attacks. So there is always a retribution if you fight for 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 justice right or if you fight for for the good uh there's going to be a lot of setbacks for you and that's that's a given okay um but anyways he did manage to go through okay and move forward he approached several like-minded people okay and around him for you know assistance and support okay so he couldn't do it by himself so that may be one difference between Superman and him is that Superman could do it by himself, but uh, Anthony Comstock uh, limited capability, so he needed people to 
uh, rally up and help him in his quest. Okay. The people who we suggested to associated with were, quote, the president of the New York YMCA, Morris K. Jessup, JP Morgan for finance. Guys, JP Morgan is a big time person, man. Uh, JP Morgan is, you know, it was a bank in America. I think they merged in with, I don't know, okay, probably Chase. Yes, I think they merged in with Chase Bank. Uh, but you know the founder of JP Morgan was for him, you know William E. Dodge and Samuel Colgate. Colgate. Probably the toothpaste Colgate was the was the guy as well who advocated for uh, you know uh, Anthony Comstock. In 1872, Senator Comstock and his supporters successfully lobbied Congress to amend the nation's anti-obscenity laws. Unquote. So this is Kennedy's report. Okay, uh, with this act. Numerous illegal obscenities that were informed and advertised in the books, pamphlets, letters, prints, and writings were taken legal action. So, guys, once the action was ratified, once the law was ratified, the the law was, you know, setting those vices in the straight path, which is a good thing, you know. When there's no laws that that doesn't penalize people who are you know, doing all this corruption, okay? Uh, it just goes like haywire, you know, people start doing it more, right? So he was definitely like a crusader, I would say. Um, but anyways, okay. So I'm gonna be speaking a little bit about Superman as well, because I did say that he's going to be in the character of our narrative, okay? So Superman is an ex extraordinary public figure from Superman action comic book, what, which was published during June, 1938, okay? Superman, okay, so Oaks writes this, okay? And I'm, I'm gonna quote, Oaks, okay, which, where is the reference here, Oaks? Oaks, J James Oaks, and this is his book, Of the People. Uh, History of the United States, which was published in 2013, okay? So, guys, this is not about the United States, okay, particularly, but I said I'm going to com compare and contrast with the uh, United States and, you know, Nagaland or Northeast India, per se, okay? And how we're, we're having this problem, which is corruption, and we kind of need to really put our heads together and kind of tackle this together because I don't think this is going to be a one-man show, I I sincerely think that, you know, it has to come up from the public. And this is something that is very, you know, ingrained in our society. Unfortunately, I, I don't think it was like this back in the day, but it has definitely ingrained. And, you know, it needs to, it needs to kind of like, it needs a medicine here. We need to find a solution. We need to do something about it. Okay. And this is sincerely, I'm speaking, speaking from my, from my heart because I've seen it. I've seen it here. I've been around for a while and I ain't liking it here. Okay, here is another question here. Captain Jack, okay, Zack Sparrow again here. Superman as in Zoroastrianism. Well, no, I'm talking about the Superman, the comic Superman hero, okay? Uh, okay, so Super, Superman was, by the way, the Superman who we're talking about about the comic was actually created by uh, a Jewish fellow in New York. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to be talking a little bit about about it. Not Zoroastrianism. That author, the comic author, comic book author, was uh, a Jewish guy. Okay, so I'll I'll go into it a little bit. By the way, so Superman was the creation of two Cleveland teenagers. Cleveland guys, where's Cleveland is in America? Okay, Cleveland teen teenagers. One is Jerry. Siegel, okay, and the other is Joe Suster, Schuster, okay, I think this is kind of like a European name, Schuster, Joe Schuster, <clears throat> um, maybe, I don't know, Siegel, okay, well, maybe second generation or third generation uh, Jewish people in America, probably, so Jerry's father, uh, Mikhail Segalovich, okay, this kind of reminds me of uh, Ashkenazi Jews, Ashkenazi Jews who immigrated to uh, America uh, during Hitler's reign, right? <clears throat> Hitler's terror, I guess. So my, Mikhail, okay, yeah, Mikhail Segalovich immigrated from Lithuania, Lithi Lithuania, renaming himself 
Mitchell Siegel. Mike, no, M-I-T-C-H-E-L-L, Michelle, Michelle, Michelle Siegel. Okay. See, see, that's why, like I said, you know, he's probably, uh, he probably renamed it because he wanted to blend in with the society. So Jerry and Joe were Jewish immigrants to parents who came from Europe between 1914 to 1920. Uh, these boys were fortunate to be in America because they did not have to face the Ukraine war and the anti-Semitic programs that were destroying the Jewish communities in and around the world, uh, particularly the Eastern Europe, right? <clears throat> it was no playground either in Cleveland, guys. It was no playground. It wasn't easy to live in Cleveland, but I think hard work and, you know, uh, luck sometimes could bring you success as well. And this is what happened to these two kids. They kind of uh, figured out, you know, so, Okay, the Congress and the YMC were major backups for Comstock, okay, and they even arranged an anti-bias committee and a special agent from the post office department to support him. Okay, so this guy, man, Anthony Comstock, he went like full out on kind of like, you know, uh, changing the American society from all his vices, right? So Superman was Clark Kent in person, okay, if you didn't know, uh, which represented the common man, but he also had a higher authority and power. It was kind of like a double identity. His parents had passed on these super qualities to him from Krypton Planet, uh, of the literature of, and the history of the, um, the comic book of Superman, okay. And, but what I wanna drive here is, um, so people like Anthony Comstock and people like Superman, you know, they try to, you know, fight the vices of of our society, uh, and it is an epidemic here that we're facing, which is uh, corruption. Okay, I know there's a lot of vices, and but I haven't been around here for too long to kind of uh, comment on it because I don't think I would be, you know, calling myself credible to do that. I would have to experience more on that, and but I do feel like I think. Corruption is very, very prevalent uh, from top to bottom, from administration to uh, the government, okay? And also not just the government, even like the, you know, uh, the, the regular, you know, uh, uh, I wouldn't say the regular, okay? But still, you know, there's, uh, I've seen a couple of them, uh, which, you know, which kind of drives me a little nuts. It's it's a it's a it's a mystery how people capture boots and you know they don't it, it's like goons you know it's it's almost like how do you take someone's right okay I mean voting boots and th okay that's just one example okay capturing voting boots and not letting people like you're literally taking their voting rights and you know threatening them like okay you know you cannot vote because we have your cards like. There's no way that you can touch it. I mean, come on, you know, this is ridiculous. But anyways, that's how it is in uh, during election. But I'm not gonna to talk too much about election here. What I'm gonna be talking about is, you know, uh, the corruption within the society in general, okay? I gave you one example, okay? Um, and probably I'll give you uh, another one uh, next time, but I think the, the that's very relevant to what I'm saying as well. Uh, because, like I said, it starts from top to bottom. And I think what we need to do is we need to really think as people. We are the free people. We have the right. Okay. Nobody else has the right. The, the higher echelons who have, you know, who have really uh, mastered the art of coming to power without people's consent, they, they cannot take, a, take our votes away, right? No, no, they shouldn't do that. And I think this is what's happening. I feel like, you know, um, the youths today are, especially in Nagaland, I would say, do not have this, the good life, you know, the, because, you know, I don't blame primarily on, you know, the older generation, because I know the older generation has uh, a lot of uh, wisdom, and I think they did a lot of good jobs as well. But, you know, the current situation here is that, you know, the, the young folks are not benefiting. 
they're suffering, okay? There's no jobs, there's hardly any jobs, okay? And there's hardly, you know, any opportunities, uh, which is very, you know, uh, which is fixed. Uh, it's, it's very, you know, uh, I would say there's, there's not much avenues for the youths today. And I think I, partly it has to be blamed to the people uh, who are responsible for running the administration and the government as well. Uh, and also, you know, some of the, you know, public as well. I think we have to blame ourselves too, you know. But going back to what America was facing, uh, you know, America during that time, they were having hard times in society as well. And this is exactly what we're facing here. Um, you know, eventually when you have a lot of goons, when you have a lot of unfaithful or un not serious people, uh, in power or in position or, you know, even like in a, just a regular like uh, position, doesn't have to be like in, in a higher position or, you know, something, you know, related to your day-to-day -day work. You know, when there's a, a mass, you know, vices, happenings all around our community, there's a lot of things that will take place, which, for example, you know, when when youths do not have certain jobs, particularly girls, what do they do? They will go into trafficking. They will go in other parts of the country and become like, you know, escorts or, you know, uh, prostitutes or, you know, high class paid, uh, you know, escorts, uh, et cetera, et cetera, you know. And don't you feel sorry for your own daughters? Uh, you think about your daughters when you do that, you know, or in the mainland India, because, you know, we haven't, some of us haven't come to a, to a point where we're smart enough uh, to kind of like make our way through, right? Um, through all the, you know, the city life and stuff. So I think this is a problem here. Um, so, yeah, I just want to point this out, like, you know, people like Anthony Comstock, when they can do it, and I think, you know, uh, he was very successful. That's that's the reason why, you know, they were the his party and his supporters were able to pass some of the laws, some of the bills, amendments, uh, which kind of helped curb a lot of the vices in the country. Okay, Captain Zach Sparrow, NSCN is fighting for a socialist nation. Whose socialism are they following? Karl Marx, Mao Zedong? <laughs> well, that's a very good question. Actually, I'm not going to go too much political here, okay? I just say leaders, okay? Or I just say, like, people in the higher echelons, okay? So, um, just, I'm not going to talk about that because I don't have too much credibility on that. But, hey, that's a very good question. Maybe some people might be more fluent on that topic, okay? Mm, so, yeah, I'm going to diverse a little bit on that. Uh, sorry, not diverse, <laughs> regress on that topic a little bit, okay? Uh, but, yes, uh, Superman, Comstock, you know, they're, they're, they're pioneers in, in what, what they do, which is care about uh, devices that was happening during that time, okay? And I think uh, women's rights is also very important. A woman in position should come uh, in all forms of, you know, uh, of our society, in, in leadership, in, in, you know, it could be in corporations, it could be in businesses, it could be in um, just associations, organizations. I mean, I think leadership, Women le leadership should also uh, come, especially I would say in the, you know, in the political realm, um, where women can, you know, um, go into election and you know win the ticket, right? And uh, hey, maybe the home minister could be a woman as well. You never know. Well, women can take care of the home. Why not become the home? Minister of a state, maybe she can take, you know, very good care of it. But uh, that's my point of view. Okay. Like I said, I said, yes, I didn't, I am not talking too much uh, 
about that kind of politics. But what I'm got, what what I'm trying to tell you is I, I do talk about this woman kind of politics or anything that is related to uh, that, you know, um, move forward in our society. I think that's kind of that's kind of my uh, my circle here. But anyways, uh, I'm going to end it here. OK, it's already 1137 and I have passed seven minutes, but hey, who cares? Do you think women can do everything a man can do? No, I didn't say that. I, I feel like we're we're similar in many ways, uh, and we're also uh, we also differentiate in many ways as well. Uh, for example, no physical work. I think man has more strength to do any kind of physical work, whereas woman cannot. Um, so, but can you do like some of the women's work? Yeah, uh, I don't think we can do a lot of women's work as well because my, I would say multitasking is uh, one of the women's. Uh, specialties and i think we men kind of need to catch up on that okay i mean in politics okay yes why not i i feel like uh, i think it's you know i think it's very much uh relevant women can do well in politics why not yes i but i do believe that the women whoever goes into politics should be credible okay should be uh, educated and i think she needs to have some strong policies where she needs to be in par with you know, with the, with the other politicians or with the other leaders or uh, policymakers or whoever, uh, they should have that credibility to kind of like um, fight alongside her, you know, compatriots or whoever is is running, you know, for the seats. Okay, all right. So if there's any other questions, guys, uh, you can ask me. Uh, we have a question here from Kenshin Beard. Okay. Oh, okay. He's asking to bliss, I think. Exactly like you. Next home messer. <laughs> Kuriwi too. Okay. But people often, bliss is saying, people often go with men, though she got the ability to do so. Sir, I'm from Dimapur and I'd be more than delighted to, to you, to probably to know you more, I guess. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Captain Zach Sparrow, I appreciate so much for your delightful comments and i'm very much um, appreciating your comment okay so guys okay it's 11 39 and past nine minutes okay uh, i guess i'll wrap it up tonight but you know uh like i said you know there's a reason why the women suffragist movements were so you know so important that we can actually look back and say like oh you know uh there is there is hope for you know women in um, politics or voting or you know in, in seats uh, uh, political seats you know so okay okay i'm gonna wrap it up okay okay please we are having okay guys i really appreciate it. this is my uh, 10th live podcast so hopefully we will continue on with my 11th one but i hope uh, you guys have a very wonderful evening and I don't know if you, some of you are uh, on the other side of the world, but if you do, well, have a good day. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll be back again. Okay. Thank you very much.